Hello and welcome to this live stream on exoplanets and exoplanet atmospheres. My name is Ryan MacDonald. I'm a theoretical astrophysicist working on a PhD in astronomy at the University of Cambridge. My research revolves around trying to characterise the atmospheres of transiting extrasolar planets, which we'll certainly get onto later today as we talk about the different ways to actually try and figure out what the atmospheres of these distant worlds are actually like. The reason why I've put this live stream together is that we often hear about detections of exoplanets. In fact, there are now 3,576 confirmed exoplanets, with many of them being due to the Kepler Space Telescope, which famously observes planets passing in front of their star, measuring a small but measurable dip, and using that to both detect the planet and also figure out how large the planet itself is. So over the course of the past week, a number of you have been sending me in questions that you would like to see answered about exoplanets and their atmospheres. Here is a selection of them, which we will get to throughout the day. And if throughout the live stream itself, you do have more questions that you think of, by all means, just drop them over on the right hand side in the chat box on YouTube, and I'll see if I can address some of them towards the end. So why don't we get started then with a question from YouTube. So Minority of Thought asks a question about exoplanet atmospheres. Could you summarise proposed methods of measuring exoplanet atmospheres, mention which ones have been successful, and then also summarise any really exciting results? Absolutely, and just answering this question will probably take maybe about 10 minutes or so, so let's get straight into it then. So I've already mentioned the Kepler Space Telescope. So if we take a look at the method that Kepler uses, in this wonderful video from the European Southern Observatory, effectively what Kepler does is it stares at a planet passing in front of a star, and then as the planet transits in front of the star, some of the light from the star is blocked, and we can measure this dip, which we call the transit depth. So that's what I'm showing here in this graphic that I've put together. Effectively, the transit depth, this dip in the light, tells us the radius of the planet divided by the radius of the star squared. And if we just were to have a boring lump of rock, for instance, that had no atmosphere, then we would simply observe a straight line, a flat line across different colours. Because a rock ultimately doesn't care if you have blue light or red light, it will block all of it equally across wavelength. But if we were to add an atmosphere to this transiting exoplanet, then we see something slightly different in that different colours of light absorb with different strength. And we all, we all know this already. If you go outside, for instance, look up at the sky, you see the sky is blue. And this is due to a phenomenon called Rayleigh scattering. Effectively, blue light bounces about in the atmosphere much more strongly than longer wavelength light, like red light, and so it spreads over the entire sky. In the case of exoplanets, that means that when blue light goes into the atmosphere of the planet, it bounces about, flies off in a random direction, and then we're less likely to observe it. And that's why we see the planet effectively appearing slightly larger at bluer wavelengths. We get a characteristic slope, which we call the Rayleigh slope. But what's really exciting for characterising these atmospheres in transmission is that at certain colours, we pick up absorption features due to chemical species. In particular, at yellow wavelengths of light, we see the planet suddenly becoming a lot larger. And that is due to sodium in the atmosphere absorbing the light. And equally, if we push forward to red wavelengths, we can see absorption features due to potassium. And this was actually predicted very early on. In fact, very shortly after we discovered the first transiting extrasolar planet, HD 209458b in the year 2000, it was predicted that we should be able to measure the potentially the detection of sodium in the atmosphere. And we did. In 2002, sodium was detected for the first time, and that was our first definitive measurement of the chemistry in an extrasolar planet for the first time. But if you want to know what's really going on and you want to get a better handle, you can actually go beyond the visible wavelengths and push outwards into longer wavelengths in the infrared. And the reason why this is exciting is that molecules such as water, 
H2O, as you're seeing here, absorb quite strongly in the infrared. And so what I'm showing here in this shaded green region is the range of wavelengths that the Hubble Space Telescope can currently observe in the infrared using an instrument called the Wide Field Camera 3, or WISC-3. And so I've also plotted on there a rough sketch of what you might expect to see for some data points using Hubble in this cartoon sketch. And so you see that if the data points suddenly seem to rise and increase around 1.4 micrometers, that can potentially tell us there is water in the atmosphere of these planets. So just now, now that I've given you hopefully some intuition for these transmission spectrum measurements, if we take a look at a real observed transmission spectrum, this is a real set of data that you're seeing in these orange circles with error bars here for the hot Jupiter HD 209458b. And, and you're seeing exactly what I showed in that cartoon graphic, that the fraction of the light blocked by the planet seems to rise at around 1.4 micrometers. And this is strong evidence, actually at the 10 sigma level, of absorption due to water in the atmosphere of this planet. And it's not even just hot Jupiters that we can do this for, although they are very easy to do this, because basically the hotter a planet's atmosphere is, when a gas heats, it generally expands. And so the atmospheres of these hot Jupiters, which have temperatures of around, oh, roughly 1000 Celsius plus or so, they expand and a large amount of the light from the star skims through the atmosphere and this makes the signals of absorption very large. We have been able to do this for slightly colder planets. In fact, just three years ago now, the first water was detected in an exo-Neptune, so analogous to Neptune and Uranus in our own solar system in terms of the mass, but much, much closer to the star. And if we want to do this for potentially rocky planets like super-Earths, it's really a challenge because they're much colder in general, and you get even colder when you actually push down to Earth-sized planets. And so we're really pushing the frontiers at the moment in just trying to get any transmission spectra for super-Earths. And unfortunately, the ones that we have have turned out to be pretty much flat due to clouds. And that's really one of the problems in transmission spectra, because when the light skims through the atmosphere, it's only basically sampling the highest altitudes, if you have a high altitude cloud, which I'm kind of sketching on the whiteboard over there, then the cloud basically blocks out the light and you won't see the absorption features. But that being said, this method of transmission spectroscopy has been remarkably successful. In fact, I've already mentioned so the sodium detection that we had in 2002. Water was detected for the first time in an exoplanet in 2007, and in 2013 actually even more rigorously established. There have also been there's also been high significant detections of carbon monoxide. There was actually a very high significance one of about five sigma in 2010, using a method I'll talk about in a moment. And they've also been suggestions of methane and carbon dioxide in the atmospheres of exoplanets. So bearing in mind that we're using instruments that were not designed to do what they are doing now. I mean, we've only known about exoplanets for 25 years. Hubble Space the Hubble Space Telescope was designed a long time before that, and so it's really incredible what we've been able to do just by repurposing instruments. So that's one of the main ways that we characterise the chemistry of these atmospheres using transmission spectroscopy. But there are a few other methods. For instance, what I'm showing here is a typical light curve. In fact, these data points are real data for the super Earth 55 Cancri E. So we've just been discussing what's called the primary transit which is where a planet passes in front of the star as we observe it. And that's this dip on the left-hand side here. But as the planet continues to go around its orbit, when it is just about to go behind the star, what we actually see is a combination of the light from the star and the thermal emission from the planet, which is why the transit, which is why the light curve here rises because we're now seeing light from the planet and light from the star. And then when the planet goes behind the star, we lose the light from the planet and we see a smaller dip, which we call the secondary eclipse. So if we can subtract 
the light from the planet from the light from the star, then we can potentially get measurements of the thermal emission of the planet from its day side. And this is really complementary to transmission spectroscopy, which probes the boundary between the day and the night side, on, because most of these planets are tidally locked. And so if you have a star, the planet goes in front of it, then the side facing us is the night side, the side facing the star is the day side, and so what we see is the boundary between the day and the night. But in thermal emission, then we can potentially see what, so what I'm showing here in this animation that Kevin Stevenson put together for the exoplanet WASP-43b is that we can actually measure the thermal emission of exoplanets today as the planet orbits around its star to probe of the planet. So in addition to absorption features like this water feature we're seeing at 1.4 micrometers, where the planet appears to be much dimmer, we can also potentially know of the atmosphere, telling, how, telling us how the temperature of the planet varies as a function of altitude, which you're seeing in the top right there. And so when you try and do these measurements, you can see all manner of interesting properties. For instance, you might notice that if you look at this peak in the thermal emission here, it seems to be slightly to the left of the secondary eclipse, which is where we'd expect most of the light from the planet to actually be emitted. So we've actually been able to use this to piece together the puzzle pieces and come to the conclusion that this super Earth, 55 Cancri E, in this wonderful animation put together by NASA, could potentially be a molten lava world with very little heat distribution. And actually, there's been recent efforts in the last year or so to construct a map of the temperature of this planet, which clearly shows that the maximum location of the temperature of the planet is not exactly at the point that is being permanently illuminated by the star, which could potentially tell us that there are flows of lava over the surface of this planet. So it's very clear that even just by looking at transiting extrasolar planets, there is a huge amount of information we can extract from their atmospheres. But we don't necessarily just have to look at transiting planets. There are ways around this. And in particular, if you'd heard about discoveries such as that of Proxima b, which came out last year, unfortunately, Proxima Centauri b is not a transiting planet. And so we can't really use the methods that I've just described. But we could in the future potentially use a method called direct imaging. Here's the basic idea. If we can block out the light from a star using a device called a coronagraph, which you see in the middle there, uh, we'll just wait till the coronagraph goes back over again, then you can potentially observe planets that would otherwise be drowned out in the light from the star. Here, for instance, is a real direct image photograph showing that you can directly see exoplanets in very wide orbits around stars. And when I say wide, I mean, if you look at this photograph, as remarkable as it is, this exoplanet, CVSO 30C, is actually at an orbital separation of 660 times that from the Earth to the Sun. For, for comparison, Pluto is 40 times as far away from the um, Sun as the Earth is. So this method at the moment really only works for planets in very wide orbits, and then also planets that are very young, because they, they effectively glow in thermal emission. They're very easy to observe. But even with current technology, we've been able to observe multi-planet systems. This is HR8799, and you can actually see four exoplanets around this star. And by piecing together measurements over a number of years in this wonderful animation that Jason Wang has put together, you can actually see the planets traveling around the star. So although it's really quite early days for exoplanet atmosphere characterization in direct imaging, one of the big advantages of this technique is that unlike transmission spectra, which only probe the top of the atmosphere, if you're looking at light which is, say, reflected from the atmosphere, or thermal emission which bubbles up from deep in the atmosphere, then you can probe much greater depths in the atmosphere. So eventually when we observe rocky planets, then we could potentially talk about measuring the surface temperature of these planets, maybe the surface pressure, and then we can start to get a handle on things like the habitability of these planets. So I've mentioned two avenues, 
transmission spectroscopy, um, both in the primary transit and the secondary eclipse, and also direct imaging. But there's also a new technique which has started to surface in the past seven years or so called high resolution Doppler spectroscopy. Here's the idea. So as a planet orbits around a star, the gravitational force of the planet tugs on the star and causes the star to basically move back and forth. As the star moves towards us, the light from the star shifts towards the blue, and as it moves away from us, it shifts towards the red, which we call the Doppler effect. So this is a famous technique used to actually detect exoplanets. But notice how some of the light from the star in this animation actually reflects off the planet as well. So potentially what we can do is we can actually measure the light which is either reflected off the planet's atmosphere or which is that, or just thermal emission from the planet itself. Because as the planet orbits around the star, that light will become Doppler shifted as well. And so we can actually use ground-based telescopes, such as the Very Large Telescope Array in Chile, to measure at very high resolution spectra of extrasolar planets. And so this has already been used to actually detect carbon monoxide in an exoplanet in 2010. And it was even used very recently to actually measure water in the exoplanet 51 Pegasi b, which was the first exoplanet observed around a main sequence star. And that's really, that's really a cool measurement because that's not actually a transiting exoplanet. So this is again another method that lets us characterise planets which unfortunately don't have the right alignment for us to actually see them passing in front of their star. So I hope that um, answers the question with that little bit of a long ramble. So let's move on to the next question then. And in fact, there's quite a few questions we have here that David sent in, many on spectroscopy and direct imaging. So I'll probably weave them in and amongst a number of the other questions. But in particular, I wanted to quickly address the question, is a planet four light years away easier to see than a planet 100 light years away? So it really depends on the method you're using. If you are using a method such as the transit method, like with Kepler, then Kepler was looking at one particular patch of the nighttime sky in its primary emission. And so it was only really sensitive to planets between about 600 and 3000 light years away. And that was basically due to the range in the brightness of stars Kepler was designed to look at. If stars were too close, they were too bright and Kepler's instruments weren't designed for it. Further away than 3000 light years, they were too dim. And so in transmission measurements, you do indeed have distance limits. In radial velocity measurements to weigh a planet, then the, me the method basically doesn't have inherently distance limitations inside of it. But the problem is that you need to have high signal to noise ratios in order to actually get precise enough measurements. And so what this effectively means is that if you want to look at very low mass planets, then radial velocity only really lets you see out to a couple hundred light years. For more massive planets which have a greater effect, then you can go out to a few thousand or so. And if you want to go to crazily high distances, then you can use something like gravitational microlensing, which um, I, I won't talk that much about because you can't really use that to characterise the atmospheres of these planets. But that's, that's a very good technique if you want to potentially look at planets closer towards the centre of the Milky Way or maybe even in Andromeda, for instance. So I hope that answers your question. So uh, another question that David had about spectroscopy of exoplanets. He asks whether it, this only works in the visible wavelength range. So if we go back to the graphic which I showed, then you can see that just in the visible, in transmission spectroscopy, we can already detect atomic species like sodium and potassium. And in the infrared, that's where we get molecular features such as water, methane, and then maybe even carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide. You can also push to even shorter wavelengths, moving over to ultraviolet light. That can potentially tell you about atmospheric escape processes and photochemistry. You could also see highly ionised metal ions high up in the atmosphere of these exoplanets. So you could potentially go out to even longer wavelengths. And this is actually this is actually a nice place to bring in another question. A question that we had in from uh, I am Grimalkin, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Is it possible to use something like the Event Horizon Telescope 
to image nearby exoplanets. So um, it would be difficult. The, the Event Horizon Telescope, for those who don't know, um, it's, it's an imaging system that works in the radio to try and image the event horizon, potentially, of the um, black hole Sagittarius A star at the centre of our galaxy. So exoplanets could, in theory, be detected in the radio. And I, I'm not talking about um, artificial emissions from, from aliens, for instance, but actually due to natural causes in that when electrons spiral around in magnetic fields, they can emit radio radiation. And we see this in Jupiter, nearby to its magnetic field, for instance. So potentially, you could measure the magnetic fields of exoplanets by looking for radio emission. Now, th this is just theoretical at the moment. There haven't actually been any successful observations of this. But in principle, you could even go all the way out to the radio and look at exoplanets naturally, which would be quite cool. Um, and one other question about the spectroscopy that um, David has is whether they have whether the spectroscopy has a resolution. And um, yes, so a usual way to quantify the resolution of transmission spectra is basically by taking a ratio of the wavelength you're observing at by the distance in wavelength between adjacent measurements, which we call the R value. So if I show you some real transmission spectra, for instance, so this is a set of 10 transmission spectra obtained by the Hubble Space Telescope. We see we have visible measurements on the left-hand side, and then towards the centre we have, and to the right-hand side, we have infrared measurements. And you can already see that with the Hubble Space Telescope, this is, the precision is pretty low on these, and the resolution, even in some of the best cases, like for the third one down, HD 209458b, then we're only really getting resolutions of maybe, what, 30, 70, 100 or so. Compare that to what we might be able to get with James Webb, which leads us into the next question. And I think you'll be very impressed by how much the resolution will improve. Because Super Gecko 8 asks, could I talk about the usage of the James Webb Space Telescope and TESS, the Transiting Exoplanet Service Satellite, to analyse exoplanet atmospheres and what information could be obtained? Well, firstly, I, I just have to note that the transiting exoplanet service satellite won't actually be able to measure the atmospheres of these planets. It's a detection mission like Kepler. And so it's basically been designed to find some of the closest exoplanets around very bright stars, which will be ideal candidates for follow up with missions like James Webb. So TESS will basically spend about two years staring at 200,000 stars and Potentially, it could see as many as 1,500 planet candidates, and about 500 of those we expect to be less than about twice the radius of the Earth, so in the Earth size to super Earth size. But James Webb will indeed be an absolutely remarkable mission when it launches in October 2018. The, the James Webb Space Telescope it looks pretty much set to revolutionise all of astronomy and astrophysics. And I'm very excited that about 25% of the time will actually be focused on exoplanets because of the sheer importance of the science questions we're trying to ask. Questions like, um, are there habitable planets out there? What does it mean to be habitable? Are we alone in the universe? These are many questions that we'll finally start to get a grip on with James Webb. So what can we actually do with James Webb? So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to show you a direct comparison between current Hubble transmission spectra and a simulation of what we might be able to do with James Webb. So I've already shown you these 10 hot Jupiters, which are real measurements. Let's now move on to a James Webb simulated measurement. And th this is incredible. Just look in, so the red curve here is a model that's actually been used to generate these simulated data points. And the black points are showing simulated James Webb measurements. And you can see that they exactly trace this curve. We can see water absorption features in the visible and the infrared. We can pick out carbon dioxide. We can pick out methane. And actually, James Webb can even go to much longer wavelengths than this. It can go out to about 28 microns or so. So James Webb will be revolutionary because it has higher precision, much higher resolution. We're going from resolutions of, let's say, 100 or so up to resolutions of nearly 3,000. And so when you combine high resolution, high precision, and a wide range of wavelengths that we can observe, James Webb will potentially tell us not just about the chemistry, 
It can tell us about the clouds in the atmospheres of planets, potentially what the clouds are made of. We can get precise determinations of what the temperature is doing on these planets. And crucially, I expect we will see many detections of new molecular species using James Webb. So we haven't actually detected oxygen in an exoplanet yet. With James Webb, I would expect to see oxygen and ozone, for instance, as well as confirming many previous detections. And then, but ultimately what I'm most excited by is the molecules that we don't expect to see. So we'll really have to keep an eye out, but James Webb is it's going to be remarkable. Uh, I should point out though that although James Webb will in principle be able to characterize the atmospheres of Earth-sized planets, these measurements will be very, very difficult um, due to reasons like I mentioned before, for instance, how when you have colder atmospheres, they tend to shrink slightly. And also if you have atmospheres which are much heavier, containing molecules like water instead of hydrogen, again, the atmosphere shrinks, and so you get much smaller signals. So it's a challenging measurement, but not impossible. So, um, okay, on to the next question then. And another one that um, David sent in. So he wants to know if we can measure the planetary surface temperature of exoplanets and potentially record changes as the planets rotate. So um, first I should point out that it seems that the majority of planets that we're observing so far are planets that are orbiting very close to their star. And so this means that due to differentials in the gravitational force, it effectively breaks the planet until the planet is tidy locked, meaning one side always faces a star and one side faces away, just like we only ever see one side of the moon, for instance. And so we can't really see these planets rotate. But um, so in principle, we could directly measure the surface temperature of exoplanets using something like the James Webb Space Telescope with very high precision measurements. Um, if you want to measure the surface pressure, for instance, then it might be better to use um, direct imaging, for instance, because of the, it's basically just due to the geometry. Transit measurements go across like this, skimming through the atmosphere, whilst direct imaging measurements come down, reflect off, and bounce out. So they penetrate much deeper into the atmosphere, so you have a better chance of actually reaching the surface and then reflecting off the surface, for instance. Uh, next question. Oh, oh, now this is an interesting one. So could we potentially observe an exo-moon? And will the technology to do this improve? So um, let's take a look at what a transit might look like if we did have an exomoon. And this is from um, uh, a wonderful paper that David Kipping put together, and he's actually had quite a few on exomoons. So on the left hand side, what you're seeing is how a planet transit might look if we have a planet and a moon orbiting that planet on very wide separation. And so if you look near the bottom, effectively you see an extra chunk is taken out of the bottom. Now, and these little circles you see are basically what you'd expect to see with the Kepler Space Telescope. So in principle, if we did have a large exomoon, and, and by large I mean, let's say, we have a gas giant and an exomoon about the size of the Earth, we should have already seen it using Kepler. And so this could potentially tell us constraints on how many exomoons there are, given that we haven't observed any in the Kepler data set. And um, it's a bit of a pity that the main Kepler mission was only able to stay stable before many of its reaction wheels failed for about 4.4 years. Ideally, if you want to observe exomoons, you need very long time baselines. So that unfortunately means that tests probably won't be that good for observing exomoons. Um, so perhaps the next best chance we will have to observe exomoons will be with the European Space Agency's PLATO mission when it launches in 2024, which nominally has a two-year mission, although hopefully it will go much longer than that. Um, and PLATO is designed to basically, uh, how to describe it? Imagine like Super Kepler in order to produce an incredible census of nearby transiting planets. Now, it won't be characterising them, that will wait for future missions, but it will really be an incredible planet detection mission. So, in short, Plato may be our best bet to look for exo-moons. Okay, so, um, and uh, a follow-on question, actually, that we've had about direct imaging this time using James Webb. Um, namely, how much of an improvement James Webb could be for direct imaging. So, currently, direct imaging of systems such as 
HR8799, have already given us detections of things like water, carbon monoxide, and methane in these atmospheres. But you have to remember that these direct imaging planets are in very, very wide orbits. And this is mainly that if you want to suppress the light from the star using a coronagraph to peer inwards into potentially reaching the habitable zone, it's really difficult. If you want to see something with an orbital separation of Jupiter, for instance, then the basically the amount of light that's reflected by the planet, it's about a billion times less than that from the star. So it's very challenging to block out that light. And for the Earth, it becomes even worse. It's like um, one hundredth of a billion, for instance. So these are truly challenging measurements. So James Webb will potentially let us push slightly further in. And we may be able to get measurements of spectra for potentially Saturn mass exoplanets. We could constrain the radius of some of these planets to about 5% or so. But James Webb, I, I would expect probably to get direct spectra for maybe on the order of 5 to 10 planets in detail, for instance, using direct imaging. But, um, but then we've got all the transit measurements as well from James Webb. So um, the, the important part is James Webb will probably just select a number of community targets and characterize them in incredible detail. And so a lot of work has to be done to actually decide which are the best candidates to actually observe. Okay, um, oh, and now an interesting far future question. So, let's see. Is it possible that an array of telescopes, the diameter of the solar system, could see small surface details on a planet that's, let's say, 10 light years away? Ah, so um, how far can we push direct imaging if we don't have to worry about pesky things like budget constraints and current technology? So if you were to be absolutely crazy and you wanted to image something as small as, let's say, I don't know, 10 metres or so, you can work out the maths and basically you need a telescope with the size of the diameter of the sun, for instance, which is clearly crazy, at least with um, foreseeable future. So it, when it gets to this point, potentially, potentially the best avenue, at least using foreseeable technology, would not be to try and, I mean, we could imagine imaging things like continents or oceans on exoplanets. That, that's potentially doable with technology within the next um, 50 to 100 years or so. But um, instead of going down and actually trying to image individual rocks on an exoplanet, it might be better by that point just to send a dedicated mission to an exoplanet. Um, I'm sure a number of you will have heard of things like the Breakthrough Starshot Initiative, which, had, which has its own plans. But if you have to choose between building a telescope the size of the sun and just sending a wafer-thin probe to go to an exoplanet, then it's probably better to take the latter approach. OK, so now a question in from Facebook from Richard about Proxima Centauri B, which made a lot of attention and a lot of a splash last year. Basically, can we currently analyse the chemical makeup of Proxima B's atmosphere? So, if Proxima B transited, then potentially, but unfortunately it doesn't seem to transit. So, that means that we do actually have to wait a few years. Now, there was actually a recent paper which I found fascinating that was looking at upgrading the Very Large Telescope to actually combine two instruments called, called Sphere and Espresso, and basically, this paper, if I recall, concluded that if you observed Proxima B for three years with a combined total of about 60 nights of observing time, then you could potentially observe water, methane and even oxygen in the atmosphere of it, in its atmosphere. So in principle, you could do that with a very large telescope, but it would take more upgrades that they're feasible, but they're not they're not planned at the moment. So. A, new, a potential good avenue to even detect if Proxima B does have an atmosphere would be to use these thermal phase curves, which I've already showed you, where you build up a map of the planet effectively, looking at the day side and the night side as the planet orbits around. Because basically, if you have an atmosphere, what it tends to do is that winds will redistribute heat from the permanent day side to the permanent night side. And so what you see on the right hand side here with this graph is that when you have an atmosphere, it tends to dampen the amount of thermal radiation emitted from the day side. But if you contrast that with just an a planet with no atmosphere, that's just bare rock, 
then you'd expect to see a much warmer day side. And so by measuring these curves, which you could do with James Webb, for instance, then you potentially could tell, at least if it has an atmosphere, even though it's not transiting. But I think it's, it's really important at this point, when you see all these nice artist concepts of planets like Proxima b, to take a real hard look at what do we actually know about these systems, which I'm summarising here. Because our knowledge is really, really limited. All that we really know about Proxima b is we know where it orbits, and that's how you can make claims like that it's in the habitable zone, which it is currently. But we don't actually even know the actual mass of the planet, how heavy it is. We only know that the mass is greater than 1.3 times the mass of the Earth. And if you don't know the radius of the planet and you just know the mass, you don't know the density. So there's still a small chance that Proxima b could actually be a gas giant, or perhaps a gas dwarf would be a, a better term. So we, and because it doesn't transit, we can't measure its size, we don't know what it's made of, we don't know its atmosphere. So there's a huge amount that we still have to learn about these planets. So be very cautious when you hear news stories talking about the closest habitable planet discovered. And in fact, there's been a lot of, there's been a lot of theoretical work recently looking at Proxima b. It's been examining whether it could even hold on to an atmosphere, because it's around a very active M dwarf star, which continually has uh, eruptions, uh, coronal mass ejections on the surface of the star, which can send UV and X-rays into its atmosphere and potentially strip off the atmosphere over hundreds of millions of years. Um, not too dissimilar than with Mars, for instance. Um, you know, Mars and its atmosphere blown away by the solar wind. So potentially we could see the case that Proxima b could, could be highly desiccated, meaning all the water's been uh, broken apart into hydrogen and oxygen and the hydrogen's blown away. So it also means you have to be careful because if you detect oxygen in the atmosphere of Proxima b, that does not necessarily mean that it's that the oxygen is due to a biological origin. It could just be that an ancient ocean has been evaporated on Proxima, the hydrogen blew away, the oxygen was left, but the oxygen is actually entirely abiotic. And there's also factors to consider like how on the early Earth, there was actually an atmosphere dominated by carbon dioxide before life evolved, and then um, the early organisms actually breathed in the CO2 and actually produced the oxygen in our atmosphere. So it could be almost, uh, almost ironic in that if you have an atmosphere that before life could arise is already seeded with a lot of oxygen, oxygen can actually be quite toxic to certain microorganisms. So the oxygen could somewhat paradoxically stop the development of life on some of these planets. So the best bet, though, if we really want to characterise Proxima b, will be to use next generation ground telescopes, like the European Extremely Large Telescope. Because unlike the three years of observational time that would be required for the very large telescope, the extremely large telescope, which should be up and running by about 2025 potentially, could directly image reflected light from Proxima b's atmosphere and enable an oxygen detection in just one night of observing time. Isn't that remarkable? A single night to make a detection of oxygen. And then you could potentially see things like ozone, for instance, and all manner of other interesting molecular species. So it's it's clear the future is really exciting for both transmission spectra and also for reflected light measurements of directly imaged planets. OK, um, another question. How long until we can get the spectra of an Earth-sized planet in the habitable zone? Do we need James Webb or do we have to wait longer than that? You may be surprised to know that we actually already have a spectrum of an Earth-sized planet in the habitable zone. You might have heard last year about the TRAPPIST-1 system, which is an M dwarf star, which is, is actually a star type that's ideal to observe exoplanets around because it's a very small and very dim star. And because the star is much smaller, it, their transits have a much larger signal. So actually three Earth-sized planets have been observed around this star. And a transmission spectrum, actually a combined transmission spectrum of the two closest in planets, TRAPPIST-1b and TRAPPIST-1c, has already been obtained and published last year in this paper um, that we see here. So we have the spectrum, but it's essentially flat. So what this enables us to do is rule out that these potentially rocky planets have very large extended atmospheres dominated by hydrogen, but we can't really make many inferences beyond that. Either the planet could have high altitude clouds, or 
this could mean that the planet has something like um, a water-dominated atmosphere, but because water is very heavy, it shrinks the atmosphere, as I mentioned earlier, making it very difficult to make these observations. You would need very precise data. So we already have one transmission spectrum, but we can't really learn much from it right now. So watch this space because I imagine many more such spectra will come, particularly when we have the James Webb Space Telescope. So the final question, which I have already prepared from Andre. So can I talk a little bit about the potential for some of these exoplanets to be habitable for humans or for life existing on them in general? So I've already talked a little bit about the, some, the problems that we can have for habitability in the case of Proxima b, for instance. So if we want to find signs of life, it won't just be enough just to detect oxygen or even just oxygen and methane, for instance. We'd have to detect potentially look for ions of oxygen to tell to try and rule out alternative explanations like the ocean evaporating, like I mentioned before. There are potentially other biomolecules we could look for, like hydrogen cyanide, for instance. Um, and then potentially the biochemistry could be completely different. We obviously only have a sample size of one from life here on the Earth. And so maybe life could have a mo liquid ammonia, for instance, on a colder planet as its main medium instead of water, in which case we could have long hydrocarbon chains as being um, corresponding biosignatures. And there's a lot of theoretical work going on to try and figure out, almost from the bottom up, what could potentially be biosignatures. Um, other aspects of habitability that we could measure is we could measure the surface pressure and the surface temperature of these planets. Uh, surface pressure is easier to measure in reflected light. Surface temperature, though, um, transmission spectra is really the way to go for that, potentially using James Webb. One really exciting avenue is we could potentially observe oceans on exoplanets by looking for either a glint in reflected light from the ocean, or potentially when light reflects off an ocean, it tends to polarise the light. And although polarisation hasn't been observed from an exoplanet yet, that's one potential avenue that we could use to actually constrain the existence of an ocean of liquid water on an exoplanet. So basically there's, there's a long way to go when we talk about habitability of these planets. But given how far we have come up to this point, I would say that we're only really just beginning. So um, those are the questions that I pre-prepared. So I'm just going to take a very quick look at some of your questions and comments that you sent in to see what we have. So let's take a look. Nice to know that people are saying that they've been looking forward to this for a while. Let's see. Um, ah, yes, a question from Gerton. Do I know of any groups that are currently working on replicating exoplanet atmospheric conditions in the laboratory? This is an absolutely excellent question. It's, it's really important because if we want to actually make detections of molecular species and atmospheres, then we need to have very good data sets that describe how each molecule absorbs as a function of pressure and a function of temperature. And so two avenues that we can use to do this are we can do theoretical um, quantum mechanical calculations from the bottom up, which involve billions of spectral lines and they're somewhat crazy. And in particular, um, uh, UCL has a very good group working on producing these, uh, what we call chemical cross sections. And you can also measure them in the laboratory because most of these exoplanets we're looking at Hot Jupiters, for instance, have temperatures about 1400 Kelvin. And so you, you can't just assume that molecules like water or oxygen will absorb at the same wavelengths as they do at room temperature. So yes, you do have to measure some of them. There, see, there's a few people with comments about Planet 9. And yeah, yeah, so um, Planet 9 hasn't been observed yet. Um, there are a number of compelling dynamical arguments that support the existence of Planet 9 in terms of um, basically, um, oh, what's the correct term? Just small, rocky, icy bodies in the Kuiper belt going on weird, elongated orbits, but um, still no direct detection for us yet. Um, and the, yeah, there are all manner of other problems. Like um, you, you can talk about how can we see exoplanets, but we can't see Planet 9. And you've got to look at the different detection methods. Planet 9 is really far out. Very little light from the sun will actually be reflected off it. It's also very cold out there, so there won't be much thermal emission from the planet. So it's a very challenging measurement to make. Many exoplanets are actually much better targets to observe. Wow, quite a lot of interesting planets. Uh, sorry, it's questions I should say. Clearly I've been thinking too much about planets. Um, 
so, okay, we will probably wrap up there then. Um, I see that there was a few other questions that we had about potential existence of aliens as well, for instance. Um, so perhaps a good a good way to sign off with, is with my own prediction. So exoplanets is an incredibly fast moving field. We've gone in 25 years from detections and 2002 we had our first atmospheric detections in the case of sodium. But it's we're basically riding an exponential curve. There are so many new telescopes and new facilities coming online in the next few years. Just TESS launching early next year, James Webb launching the end of next year as well. Then we get Plato coming and we've got missions like WFIRST, which will help with direct imaging, although I haven't mentioned direct, um, WFIRST that much. So I would say that my personal prediction is that I would be very surprised if we don't have a first potential detection of biosignatures in the next five to ten years. That's my prediction, we'll have to see, and maybe it'll be a bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy because I, I obviously work on transmission spectra and interpreting them myself, so, oh great, so now I've got to find life in the next five years, haven't I, to fulfil the prophecy? Great. Okay, well you have to set yourself interesting targets. So yeah, five to ten years I reckon we'll see the first potential signs of maybe oxygen or ozone in the atmosphere of exoplanets. So thanks everyone for tuning in. If you do have any more questions that I haven't been able to address live, then just drop them in the comments after this video is posted and I will try to address them. So bye for now, everyone, and thanks for choosing in. Plenty more content on exoplanets will be coming in the near future. Bye for now.